The following podcast is a presentation of Project I Radio 24 7 Nergasm. <laughs> No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f- What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f- Brian Keane was also unavailable for comment. And welcome back to The Horror Show, brought to you by Project iRadio. I'm your host, Brian Keene. With me once again, as always, the next president of the United States of America, Dave Meteor Notes Thomas. Um, I would just like to go on record as saying that I couldn't be possibly worse than anyone who's currently running for president. <laughs> um, and in fact, I think the random ugly dolls I have in my office might actually do a better job even than me. Um, before we get started, I want to make a shout out today to uh, someone who listens to the show. And that's my friend uh, Lizzie, otherwise known as Falafel. I want to congratulate her and Nate on their upcoming wedding. And, uh, you know, I hope to see you guys soon. Yay! So, yeah, you've, you've Liz, never met her. You've heard me talk I, about I've, her. I've heard of you, her. I don't yes. know Nate. Yeah. No, uh, never, I'm never, sure he's a good guy. Yeah. He better be. No, he is, he's awesome. He, and, um, he better be. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're getting married in a couple weeks, and, and they're going to do a celebration here later this year on the East Coast. Yeah. They live in Seattle, so uh, I'll get to see them then. Well, very but, uh, cool. Well, congratulations yeah. yes. to them. Yes, and they do listen to the show. Well, so, excellent. Yeah. So there's two people that Yeah, exactly. To. Well, that's that's three more than three guys with beards. So. You know, speaking of <laughs> listeners to the show, I want to I wanna, I wanna take a moment to mention Project iRadio's patron page. Uh, Project iRadio's network has experienced unprecedented growth over the last year. Um, but with that unprecedented growth, of course, comes unprecedented bills. Uh, for just $1 a month, you can help the network in covering their hosting costs and ensuring that the hosts of the podcast that you enjoy never have to pay for hosting themselves and can focus instead on what matters most for you, making amazing content like what you hear here. Um, by becoming a supporter, you'll get access to exclusive audio and video and much more uh, I'm going to be putting some exclusive content up there as well now that the uh, the Naughty List Kickstarter is over with. Um, to find out all about it, go to patron.com slash Project iRadio. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Project iRadio. Uh, I see Max is in studio. What, what's he doing to you? <laughs> Max is there? currently using me as a scratching post. Max, um, get. That's nah, okay. I'm get. used to this. If I'm distracted today, this will be why. Look at him, look at me. Max like, is like, well, he's in a fuck you. attention mood today. He's like, no, oh, bet me, bet me. Oh, All right. this is the best thing ever. Well, coming up later, we've got an exclusive interview with one of the hottest new names in horror fiction, Adam Caesar. Uh, but before we get to that, we've got some news and other things to cover. I also want to mention, Dave, um, of course, last week we had author John Goodrich here in studio with us. Uh, several people online mentioned that Throughout that show, they could hear Phoebe and Mike Lombardo in the background, and they, they wondered what the two of them were up to. Uh, should we tell people what they were up to? Well, I mean, there was just a bunch of people here. Yeah, Adam, yeah. we recorded Adam and John on the same day, right. and Adam rolled in here with a posse. Yes. Uh, something I have not seen a writer do since <laughs> I used to do it. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah that warmed my I was my impressed, heart. actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Adam, Adam and John were both here. Uh, John's significant other was here, and, and Adam had a, a bunch of folks roll in with him. Uh, so, yeah, you will hear some of that bleed over again in today's interview. You'll, you'll hear a, 
the Phoebe and Lombardo show going on in the background <laughs> once again. And that is what they were doing. Um, they, were, they were practicing for their own show. Later this year, when Dave and I are out on the road, and we're going to be out on the road a lot. Yes, we summer, are. Um, we are going to, in fact, let Phoebe and Mike Lombardo guest host one episode. Um <laughs> And that'll probably be the end of that. We're not going to say what they're going to do. They have a plan. Yeah. I and trust me. I think it's going to be phenomenal. You you guys are going to want to hear this because they, and they they two of them came up with this together. Yeah. So I I, I it, think it's going to be amazing. And that's all we're going to say. We're not going to hype it up anymore. I think what they have planned yeah. is a great idea. Oh, yeah. And I it's think genius. I think it could be a, a monthly or, or biweekly regular format show. Um, given her schedule, not maybe monthly, if yeah, not. yeah, because she has a wacky work schedule, unfortunately. But um, you know, it, it yeah, <laughs> they they are uh, they'll be entertaining. <laughs> Jesus, though, man, I, I'm I'm looking at these these signing tour dates. You know, I'm going to be out in the road for not one book, but two books, promoting both the complex, which will be out in in paperback and ebook, and pressure, which will be out in trade hardcover. Any book, and I'm looking at these dates, and I mean, we're we're all over the country now. I know you're not coming with me for the whole thing. Well, I, you know, if I was independently wealthy, yes, and then we get our <laughs> RV, and you could have your adventures, and I could be out of jail every day. But um, that that isn't going to happen. Now, I, you know, I, I will be with you on as many dates as I can, and I, I'm sure the listening public can't wait to meet me. Um, you know, it's right up there with. Going to the eye doctor, I'm sure. I bet there will be people that will be excited to meet you. You always say that, and then I always point out, like at the Scares the Care convention last year, the guy that said, "I want to meet Dave. Where's Dave?" Okay, you know? but you compare that to the number of people that want to meet you, and or you know anybody they, else. They don't. It's, really, they it's, don't really it's a want to pretty meet me. insignificant they, number. They just want me to sign their books and. Then they flip those books on eBay. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> to future eBay recipients. I just, <laughs> did you ever sign a book like that? I or? did sign a book like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the guy was very honest. Okay. Um, he told me. Okay, I had a long line of people. There were probably 30 people in That's line. That's a big line. It was, it was at this, uh, I think it was a Walton Books. I remember it was in a, it was in a mall. Um, this must have been around 2007, 2008. And, you know, there's like 30 people in line, and uh, this guy has a stack of leisure paperbacks, multiple copies of the same titles. You know, he's got like six copies of The Rising, six copies of City of the Dead, etc. And, you know, he's maybe the halfway point in the line, and he gets up to my table, and I made a joke. I said, boy, you must really enjoy The Rising to have that many copies, because I've never read them. <laughs> These are just eBay copies. And... Uh, I asked him if he'd consider just waiting to the end of the line and let the other folks get their chance. And no, he didn't want to do that. Uh -huh. So I, I signed them, congratulations, eBay winner. <laughs> and uh, he didn't notice what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's so I, I don't know whatever happened to those copies, but uh, yeah, uh, perhaps they went to future eBay winners. Yeah, I, I don't mean, know. look. I don't. I don't have a problem doing that, but. Uh, but I do have a problem if there's if there's people there with one book, you know, and and it's it's obvious they drove and they read the book and they they want to have a connection, they want to have a moment. I, I want to make sure those people get their moment and get that connection. Yeah, well, and, that's, you know, then I'll be sense. I'll be happy to sign your your eBay stuff and you yeah. can go make a profit off of it. I mean, you, you know, know a, a normal person when you suggested and want you wait to get in line would have been sure. You know, because that's being polite, but, you know, politeness in our society don't usually go together too well. So, uh, um, so uh, yeah, last, last weekend uh, was my birthday. Yes, it was. So it was always, you know, exciting. Um, Phoebe and I went out to a really nice restaurant called Post in D.C. Um, it's in a hotel that used to be the post office, hence the name. Okay. Uh, we've been there for my 50th birthday four years ago, so we went back, and it was really good. And the other thing we did... Wait, wait, that was for your 50th birthday. Four years ago. Four years ago. I just... David Scow, David J. Scow, I know you're listening. Oh, yes. He just hollered at me this week. He said he said he was tired of you and I referring to, to ourselves as old, because if we were old, that made him the fucking mummy. <laughs> Quote, unquote. That's so hilarious. I, I just want to point out, David, uh, that, that Dave... 
is not that far behind you, and therefore, no, you are not the fucking mummy. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's it's t- <laughs> age is one of those things you can't do anything about it. So I just try not to worry about it, and it is what it is. Yeah. So anyway, we, you're we, you're so we did post. that, and then uh, no, we had this great meal, and then the other thing we did, and we're not obviously going to talk about it this week because you haven't done it yet. We went to see Deadpool. Yes. And all I'm going to say is I'll be stunned if I see a better movie this year. And that's well, all I'm going to say. About I uh, I am going to see it with my oldest son this weekend. Um, I don't know anything about Deadpool. He came along at a time when I was getting out of comic I'm books. the same way because yeah. Phoebe was asking me questions about you know the character. And I was like, I never read any of these comics. Yeah. I, I know what you know from watching the trailer. Yeah. My, it's, it's like me, if I was allowed to kill people, the yeah, extent of my <laughs> knowledge is there's a, there's an episode of, of the Spider-Man cartoon that guest stars Deadpool. And, uh, it's my youngest son's favorite episode. Yeah. Um, and he's crushed that he can't go see the Deadpool movie with, with me and his big yeah. brother, but there's no way. Um, uh, no. Not from everything I'm hearing. No, you know? no, it is not how he's what seven no. or yeah, he's he'll be eight next mm-hmm. month. No, yeah, well, it's R rated. Yeah. I'm not going to let no. him. No, and and you know that we we're not going to talk about the movie, and I, maybe you want to talk about this next week too after you see the movie. But but I have this thing, and you know I always yell at Kazami kids, and so I'm not supposed to have an opinion. But guess what? I have one. Um, not all entertainment needs to be kid friendly. No, it doesn't. I you know I I'm not saying. Kids shouldn't have things that they enjoy, and there shouldn't be things the family can enjoy together. But it's okay to make adult-themed entertainment. I'm well, not talking exactly. about porn. I'm talking about like like this or things like, know, like Garth Ennis's Preacher, yeah. or Edward Lee's The Big Head, yeah, or I, The Sopranos, you know, Breaking Bad, Breaking you know? Bad. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like it's okay for adults to have things to entertain them that the kids aren't into. You right. Know? And I just I you know because I saw a lot of people whining online. Oh, my kids, I'm taking my kids to see this. And blah, blah, blah. It's like. Your kid will live if he doesn't see this movie. You know, were there movie. were there any kids in the theater? That, that was surprising. First of all, this was the most crowded that we had because we always go early in the morning, right? Because you know, hopefully, most of the drunks are still passed out. So uh, you know, we went to the, the local IMAX theater. It was packed. It is the most crowded movie I can remember in quite some time. Really? Now, granted, we didn't go see Star Wars until it was after it was out for two weeks, right? So we kind of missed out on that. But uh, as far as opening weekend, usually we go on Saturday or Sunday morning. And all the movies we've seen, like in the last year, by far the most crowded movie theater. I mean, there was not a seat left, you know, anywhere. Um, so it was packed. We didn't. She she commented on this when we left. We didn't spot one kid. Really? All, well, all that's adults. Good. Yeah. No, it's good. That's good. So we'll save the conversation about the movie for next week because there are some stuff, that, things I, I want to get your opinion about. Um, like you, I was totally burned out in the whole superhero thing. Yeah. Uh, this reinvigorated me. Really? Like, if you could make more movies like this. I'm into the superhero thing. You okay. know, it's just, it's, I, it's very clever. Yeah, like I said, I've yeah. got, I have no association or knowledge no, of the I, character. Uh, yeah. My oldest son, now, he grew up on Deadpool and, you know, the whole 90s thing. Um, so this is the one he's been waiting for. Um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to see it, and we'll talk about that next week. Probably a, a spoiler review. So Yeah, uh, we'll do that at the end of the show yeah. like we usually do. Um, the, the other stuff I watched, uh, I know you said you didn't watch Walking Dead, so we won't talk about that. And I also watched, uh, I guess, Monday Night, Better Call Saul started again. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it hasn't shown up on Roku yet, so okay. I, haven't, I haven't gotten to see yeah, Better Call. I, I guess it'll be on there tonight. Probably. Because, um, yeah. X Files airs on what it's Monday Mondays. nights, yeah, and I always get them Tuesday morning. Yeah. So yeah, the Roku um, thing is a little delayed sometimes. It is, so. but it's so worth it. Nah, it's, um, I, yeah, yeah. I, I actually, I want to put that question out to the listening audience. You reminded me. Um, obviously, we talk about Walking Dead on this show. I am of a mind that we talk about Walking Dead too much, and that maybe people are getting tired of us talking about it. So. I put it to you, listening audience. Uh, should we continue to, to comment on each new episode of The Walking Dead, or should we let it go and, and only bring it up if they really do something really stupid? <laughs> but is that every episode? Well, I mean, <laughs> it's not like the HWA is writing the episodes. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even check the news. I don't know if HWA did anything stupid this I, week or I not. Didn't, I didn't see anything, but um, I pretty much... I, one of my gifts I always give myself around my birthday is staying offline. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, because you know, I've I've had it with humans. Um, it's only February, and I'm already tired of, you know, political commentary from people that, you know, 
get all their news from the television. So, you know, I haven't forbid you to read anything or think. Uh, so, you know, I think I just mentioned before, I've, I pretty much curated my uh, Facebook feed and, and blocked certain websites and, and things that now pretty much all it is is cat videos. Nice. Because <laughs> it's like, when I go online, I just, I have this thing now where I go online and I, I'm online until I see something that irritates me and yeah. then I go off and do something constructive. And it usually takes about five minutes. <laughs> you know, so I just, I, I, maybe I'm, you know, I'm sorry to mention my old age, but maybe I'm getting grumpy in my old age, but I just, I don't care about a lot of bickering and nonsense and drama and, you know. You're a mummy. Yeah. You're a mummy, I'm Dave. A mummy. Yes. You and David Scales. Yes. yes. <laughs> exactly. I'm a mummy. So. All but, right. Uh, that that so. Well, happy birthday. Thank to you. you. Man. Yeah. I'm it's... glad it was a good one. Oh no, it's it. We always have a good time. So. Uh, well, good. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's turn to the news. We start with some sad news. Um, our friend Mark Justice passed away last week. Um, it actually happened before we recorded last week's show. Uh, or excuse me, after right. we had recorded last week's show. So we didn't get a chance to mention it then, but we will talk about it today. Um, I guess Mark was admitted to the hospital after going to the doctor for what he thought was his gallbladder. Um, it turned out he had suffered a heart attack. So they kept him. And uh, he was posting on Facebook from his hospital bed. He mm-hmm. sounded fine. Unfortunately, about 3 o'clock that morning, he suffered another massive heart attack, and they could not resuscitate him. Uh, it was a it was a big shock. Uh, you know, Mark was an author. His books included "Looking at the World with Broken Glass in My Eye," which is a phenomenal collection. Um, and with David Wilbanks, he wrote the Dead Earth series. Uh, very good post apocalyptic stuff. Very pulpy. Um, he also ran one of the first, and in my opinion, one of the best horror fiction centric podcasts, Pod of Horror. Um, I really can't stress enough, you know, we, we've talked about the origins of this show many times, but you wouldn't have this show or three guys with beards or Kelly's show any or of Armand's show, yeah. any of them without pot of horror. Right. So, you know, Mark was the originator on this ship. He was also a longtime morning show disc jockey in Ashland, Kentucky. Um, and it was on that morning show where he would occasionally promote horror fiction over the years. He did, you know, this is this is morning zoo. This is rush hour traffic. And he had Richard Lehman on as a guest. He had Jack Ketchum, F. Paul Wilson, Joe Lansdale, uh, Jesus Gonzalez, and myself. Um, I've signed in Ashland numerous times throughout the last 20 years. I, I always have good luck in Ashland. I guess they're starved for entertainment there. <laughs> I don't know. But... Uh, you know, every time, every time I hit town, Mark was always happy to have me come on the show, and you know, I'd hang out with him afterward. In fact, I'd been planning on seeing him again later this year during the tour. Um, you know, he was just—he was a generous, genuine, and very, very funny guy, and uh, he knew this genre's history like few others, and and we will miss him. Um, I guess my favorite Mark story—I can't remember. Which which book it was, but I was on tour. I was signing in Ashland, and Batman Begins had just come out. It was opening weekend, and uh, I guess the manager of the theater was a, a big fan of both my books and Mark's show, and uh, he got us in for the Thursday night midnight premiere. And I was so fucking tired. <laughs> I'd, I'd been on the road. I'd been on tour for like three months at that point. And it's midnight, and you know Mark's radio station. They they'd always put me up in a hotel room when I'm in Ashland. I just want to go back to the suite and get some sleep. Instead, it's me and Mark, and uh, this guy Big Joe, who used to kind of act as my bodyguard on tour. The three of us are sitting there, and we're in the front row. You know, with mm-hmm. seats of honor. You know, um, and we're sitting there watching Batman Begins. I fell asleep about 15 minutes into the movie. Well, yeah, there's no way you're going to stay awake. And I'm yeah. snoring loud. And like during the quiet parts, you can hear me snoring. Apparently, Mark recorded all of that. And <laughs> he would threaten me over the years. He was going to play it on the air, play yeah. it on the podcast. I don't think he ever did. But, yeah, he used to ride my ass about that. But, yeah, I, you know, this show's dedicated to him. And he was a good guy. You've met Mark. Yes, before. I have. Uh, he used to come to Horrifying. Yep. I don't know if he came every year, but I, enough that I remember. Most years. Most years. And, and he would bring his brother with him. Yes. Yep. Bring his brother. Remember him and his brother. Yeah. Yep. No, great guy. And like you said, Pot of Horror. As far as I know, that was the first horror-related podcast. It was. I, you know. Uh, well, for horror fiction. For horror fiction. I yeah. think maybe D. Snyder's 
podcast predated yeah, it. Yeah, maybe. But, but, but D wasn't talking about books. He wasn't about books, no. Yeah. No. So, uh, yeah, this show wouldn't exist, with, with, and none of our shows would exist without him pleasing the show at Potter Hart. There's no two ways about it. Yep. So, no, he's a great guy. Um, very shocking to, you know, I basically got out of bed and got on Facebook the other morning, and, you know, I saw these posts, and I'm like, what the fuck? And, you know, right. um, and this just goes back to my thing I, I'm always saying to people, you know, you, you never know how long you're going to get. No, you, you know? don't. I had a very similar situation as he did where I went to the doctor for one thing, and next thing you know, I'm in the hospital attached to a machine known to man. Yep. You know? Now, I lived through my experience. I'm very lucky. Um, you know, I, I joke about stuff like this all the time, but I'm also kind of serious. It's like, turn your phone off. Interact with, like, your significant other. Exactly. Go outside and feel the warmth on your skin. You know, seriously, pet your cat. Um, you know, go to a show. You know, do, do stuff. Don't spend your day on the Internet. You know? Goddamn right. And don't spend, you know, if you can figure out a way, don't spend your whole life working a job you hate. I have you a know? rule uh, when, when my youngest son is here, and, and you know me, I'm yeah. like, Unlike most divorced dads, I see my youngest son almost seven days a week. Right. Um, during my time with him, I, I don't turn my phone off, but I don't fucking look at it. Right. You know, um, and people get mad. Well, I, I sent you that text four hours ago. Well, yeah, well, I'm sorry. I was playing with Star Wars action figures, you know. Anybody uh, that gets mad in a situation like that, unless it's a dire emergency, needs to be whacked on the skull. Yeah. Because I, I'm sorry, you know, uh, your time with your kid is pretty much more important than almost anything. Yeah, you know, um, I have a special guest now. As Max is in your lap, what yeah. the hell is he doing? He's just sitting on me. Okay. Yeah, he wants to be a bit of pet him, so I'm gonna pet him. Right. But you know, uh, Mark, you'll be missed, and uh, you know, your family condolences to you, and especially your brother. Um, Absolutely. What's his brother's name? I, you know, I can't, I can't remember. I can't remember. I drank with the guy. I know. I, I have to. How terrible. I, is I know. That? I I feel bad. I was just like, I should have looked his name before the show, um, but. Uh, no, I remember those guys from our fine. They were always a ton of fun to hang out with. They were. Um, you know, they and our, were. Our, and fr- our friend Tomo and those guys could put away the beers. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> our, our friends, uh, yeah, Tomo and, and Ron Dickey. Yeah. And they can put Keelan, Patrick, Burke, and I to shame yes. when they set their minds to drinking. And uh, But, yeah, Mark could match them. Uh, Mark, and, Mark and his brother, those four basically yep. would hang out in front of our fine. And it, it was just fun just to stand there and listen, listen to them talk. It yep. was amazing. Yeah, I still think when when we have Keelan on, instead of an interview, we should just have a drinking contest, and, and it'll be like a twenty four hour podcast. But <laughs> he will probably I, win. I, well, he's definitely going to win with me because I, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring wine and I'll drink a bottle of red wine. And I'll fall asleep. So. I see. I, I don't know. Now I'm thinking. I think Keelan might not be drinking. That. I, you know, I wasn't. When you said that earlier, I thought I remember seeing that. And if so, sure. then then I apologize, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah we're certainly and, not going to. Don't don't let me, you know, dissuade you. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> we'll we'll just we'll have him on and I'll drink. There you go. <laughs> and and then he can interview me. <laughs> that could be entertaining. That'll right? turn out well. <laughs> That'll yeah, riveting hour of entertainment there. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about something a little more serious. Did you hear Jeepers Creepers 3 has been greenlit? I, I have and not. Is in production? Oh, no. yes. Um, now, over on the Brian Keene forum, writer John Gauthier, John, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, he posted the following. There's an interesting discussion going on over at Bloody Disgusting's Facebook page under their recent post about the upcoming Jeepers Creepers 3. For those of you who may be unaware, the director of this film and the first two films in the series, Victor Salva, is a convicted child molester. Now, I'm going to stop right there from John's quote. It's very important to point out, convicted, not alleged, convicted. Okay. Okay. Back to John. Salva served his time and completed his parole, but the question remains, should this filmmaking endeavors be supported given his monstrous and evil actions? The bigger question, I guess, is, <coughs> excuse me, if it's possible to separate artists from their moral character. This is similar to the recent World Fantasy Award H.P. Lovecraft issue, but obviously it's far more serious. Are some actions so heinous that the artists who committed them should not be supported in any way? Should they, in effect, be blacklisted from the entertainment industry altogether? Uh, John then said that he would like us to talk about this. On the show, and I informed him that, hey, guess what? It was already in the show notes. So <laughs> let's talk about this. Um, I, you know, first let's talk about. Let's address his second question: Is it possible to separate artists from their moral character? What do you, What do you think, Dave? 
Um, I you know take Victor Salva out of the equation. Yeah, it's, think of somebody like I don't know Harlan Ellison. <laughs> you know, right? Because Harlan's just it's just because he's Harlan. He's yeah, lack of a better description. He's a, he's a crazy where, old man. Where is what he is. This does point. it reflect on his writing? I, to me, it's like on a case by case basis. Harlan, to me, is just, he's a guy, and I've never met him. I've never had any interactions with him. Right. So I, you know, I hear the stories. Obviously, and the thing we have now, you know, we didn't have twenty years ago is the internet, where like everybody's dirty little secrets are, you know, within five clicks on Google. Right. So you know a lot more about, or you can find out a lot more about the people whose art you enjoy now than you could, you know, twenty years ago. Right. There's a lot more controlled with interviews, and and some people were inclusive and things like that. Um. I, I only get in, I can only speak for me. And to me, there are certain lines that I can't get over. Right. And, um, you know, I, I know I, I go back and forth in this. It's, I, this is something I thought about a lot, uh, you know, especially in the last year with the H.P. Lovecraft thing. Because, you know, Lovecraft, even on a right fiction, Lovecraft has a huge influence on me. Right. You know, I enjoyed his stuff when I was. High school, college age, that's when I discovered Lovecraft. And, um, you know, I, I love Call of Cthulhu, the role playing game, things like that. But, you know, Lovecraft said some really heinous shit. So, right. you know, and, and stuff that's just like, really? Dude, what the fuck's wrong with you? You know, that, but, you know, it, it, it's a thing that goes back and forth. And we had this conversation on the show. It was actually me and Coop, you were away that week, about the, the bust. For the World Fantasy Award, and we right. both agreed, yeah, it's probably a good idea to change it. I mean, my idea of Bigfoot holding the American flag, I still say is a great idea. <laughs> I don't know why they're not jumping on this, you know. But um, it, it's it's one of the things I, I thought about this a lot because I know a lot of musicians, you know, right? And like I like their music, but then you know I've seen them do stupid things or you know heard from somebody else, you know, this guy did some, you know, was drunk and did this or that or whatever. You know, I'm not gonna name names or anything, um, but. You know, so you go back and forth, it's like, well, you just listen to music, or, but then, you know, people cross the line, you know, like, uh, I, you know, when they say I, there was somebody the other week, uh, that was espousing white power philosophy, and I'm like, no, okay, we're done now, you know, yeah, that kind of thing. It's like, there's certain things I just not, I'm not going to tolerate, you know, well, I, and, and, and willful ignorance like that. And I got to say, the, the child molesting thing, I understand the guy was in jail, you know, he did his time or whatever. I, I could not let that go. Well, and yes, yeah. I, I now I'm not saying the guy can't make his movies as America. You know, we have this freedom of speech and this and that. And if somebody wants to give them money to make a movie, okay, you know, I, you can't stop them. I won't be supporting it. Right. You know, I won't be promoting it. I certainly won't see it. I, you know, it's not going to spend any money on it. That's just, but that's, that's me. You know. Well, I, I agree. Um, you know, to, to John's second question, uh, yes, to some extent, I can separate an author from their moral character. Um, Lovecraft, for example, I absolutely think the bust should be changed. Um, you know, if I was an African American yeah. author, oh, absolutely, and I I was given this award by my peers honoring my work, and the award was the face of a man who would have been very happy to see me in chains. Yeah. I don't want that fucking yeah. looking down at me from my <laughs> award show. Exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, yeah, uh, it's terrible to even think about that. Yeah, I mean, Lovecraft was, he was, he was, he was not a pleasant human being. Yeah. And it's not just his racism. He had all kinds of other issues too, that, that people don't seem to talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, however, that being said, uh, you know, he left behind a remarkable body of work, and his influence on the genre cannot be understated enough. Yeah. And I can't sit here and say I'm never going to read a Lovecraft story again, uh, because I will. I enjoy them. Um, you know, the same way I enjoyed William W. Johnstone's terrible horror novels <laughs> back in the '80s when I, when I was a teenager. I, you know, I mean, he had some some pretty extreme political ideas as well. But you know, at the time. <laughs> Those were, you know, at, at age 16, there's a lot of fun. You know, the devil's cat. I was just going to say, know. the devil's cat, which uh, I need to find a copy of that. I've so. got a copy in there on the well, show. Well, an extra copy of okay. Defeaty. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yeah, there's, I, you know, I'm, okay, I'll tell a story. Um, and you know what? I'll even use names. Uh, Ray Garden. Ray Garden was uh, one of my mentors starting out. I read Ray. You know, years before I, I started trying to write professionally, and I loved Ray. He's a good guy. 
um, he was going through some stuff. He was in a lot of physical pain, and uh, he lashed out at me one night on the internet. You might remember this. The, uh, the I totally remember this. Forums. Yeah, I remember this. And he said some really mean shit. He to did, me. yes. And quite frankly, he hurt my feelings. And so me, <laughs> feeling wounded and hurt, lashed out back at him, and I, I said some really mean shit. I said some mean shit to the point where F. Paul Wilson, Tom Monteleone, and Doug Winter emailed me privately and said, hey, you can't be saying that. But at that point, you know, fuck it. The man hurt my feelings. Well, anyway, Ray and I, we go back and forth, back and forth, arguing with each other. And I was so hurt that I sold every Ray Garten book I owned. Uh, I took him into the York Emporium, and I, and I sold him. And I I regret doing that. Uh, you know, a lot of them were personally signed to me by Ray. And, you know, I've since over the years, Ray and I have squashed it, and I've now turned around and, and bought many of those books again. So, yeah, I... I do have a tendency to, uh, you know, if it's something, I don't know about moral character, but if it's something I take personally, then, then yeah, I, mm. I have a tendency to, to rid that author's work from my life. Um, now, in the case of Victor Salva, completely different level, yeah. okay? Let me, let me be clear. Here, John wants our thoughts on mm -hmm. Victor Salva. Here, here are my thoughts, John. Victor Salva is a bag of fuck. He has always been a bag of fuck. He will always be a bag of fuck. You know, um, I've been aware of the the allegations against him back when they were just allegations, okay, before he was ever convicted. Um, in the past, there were two times, two times where I was scheduled to make a public appearance at an event where Victor Salva was also scheduled to appear. Both times, I firmly declined because of the allegations against him. I won't work with him, I won't promote him, and I damn sure won't give my money to him or anyone who does still work with him or promotes him. Because now, now, it's not allegations. Now he's convicted. Right. Okay? And he's done his time and he's yeah. out of jail. So if you're working with him now, you can't say you weren't aware of Exactly. This, okay? Yeah. You know, now there are some on social media that are saying, well, he's done his time, he served his sentence. Well, what about his victims? What about the time that they have to do? What about their sentence? Because you know what? It's a life sentence for them. I know people this has happened to. So some, do I. You know, yeah. Both of us. Some of the people we're closest mm -hmm. to, this has happened in their lives. And, and they're still doing their time. They're still dealing with it. They're surviving it. They always will be. It is a life sentence for them. Okay? So, fuck Victor Salva. And you know what? Fuck Variety and Cinema Blend and, and all these other Hollywood uh, news organizations. Every one of them this, this week, they reported that, oh, Jeepers Creepers 3 is happening. Not one of them, not one of them fucking mentioned Salva's conviction for nah, being a child rapist. That's ridiculous. Okay, which is yeah. what he was. Yeah. Now. Like I said, you could say the folks involved in the first two movies didn't know about his crimes, but that was then and this is now. So fuck Victor Salva. Fuck you, Myriad Pictures. Fuck you, Jonathan Breck, who is returning to play the Creeper again. And fuck you, Francis Ford Coppola, for financially backing this bullshit. Yes, Francis Ford Coppola. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Now I'm well, mad. I, well, here's the thing. I think the best thing we do is not give them any sort of promotion whatsoever. No. Not even talk about them. No. Yeah, you because know, I, I, I refuse to believe the Earth has been clamoring for a Jeepers Creepers 3 anyway. So, <laughs> you know. I, I, also, I never saw the first two I was films about to because say, of him. I know? don't even... You, you said earlier, the Jeepers Creepers 3, and I was going to be like, what's Jeepers Creepers? Oh, I've heard the title. But I, I've never seen them, and I certainly have no intention of seeing them with this, with this guy's involvement. So, uh... Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, it's like Edward Kramer, okay? And I got to be careful how I phrase this here because, you know, that that man's lawyer will, will sue a bug if it flies into Kramer's eye. I, there were always, 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 since the day I started working in this industry back in the 90s, there were allegations involving Edward Kramer and children. Um, and everybody, oh... No, no, I don't believe so. And a lot of people continued to work with him. Okay, but people I trusted told me, oh, no, those allegations are true. So I never worked with the guy, and I was invited to. I was invited to be in anthologies, um, anthologies that 
at the time, I was just starting out as a writer. They they would have cemented me mm-hmm. a lot faster. But I refused to work with the fucking guy. You know, um, I guess to answer your question, Jonathan, is it possible to separate artists from their moral character? It is. I think what's more important is you as an artist, your own moral character. No, you know, look, I'm not saying I'm a saint, okay? My moral character is questionable in well, some regards. You know, um, you know I, <laughs> I like the ladies a little too much. Uh, you know, I, I've ingested every illicit <laughs> substance known to man. Um, yeah, I'm quick to anger, but I... I also know there are some things I believe very strongly in, and and one of them is that that people like Victor Salva, you know, that's just that's one of the most evil fucking things I can imagine, and and no, I wouldn't work with somebody like that, and I don't give a fuck what it costs me, and and I can say that because I have refused to work with people like that, and I know what it costs me, and you know what, I'm okay with that, right? So. We hope that answered your question. Yeah, we hopefully. will not be talking about Jeepers Creepers 3 anymore. No, we won't. I hope Myriad Pictures tries to buy advertising on this show. Um, yeah, ain't going to happen. Actually, that'd be, you know, that'd be funny as hell. We should get Jess at Project I Radio to like court them, You know, put together this big advertising budget, and then they give us the ad copy, and you and I change it, rewrite it. No, no, no. That 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 sounds like a lawsuit waiting to happen. I don't need the aggravation. Well, yeah. But I just like seriously, the best thing is just not to even mention this unless there's a newsworthy reason to do so. I agree. Let it just sink and go away, and this guy can, you know, go live in the woods somewhere and well, leave the world alone. Well, anyway, fuck all now. Yeah. Um, happier news. Happier news, Dave. <laughs> Are you a fan of Herschel Gordon Lewis? Uh, not so much because I'm not a huge gore person, but I know who he is. Okay. He's very obviously very influential. I'm I'm a R. giant Herschel Gordon Lewis yeah. fan. Um, Novello Publishing has a new tribute anthology coming out. It's titled "The Gruesome Tensum," a short story tribute to the films of Herschel Gordon Lewis. Um, there's a reason I'm bringing this up, though. I mean, you know, there's new books come out every week. We don't talk about them. Um. Novello is a small indie publisher. They don't have the millions of dollars the big New York publishing houses have. You know, they're, they're like Deadite, uh, you know, or Sinister Grin, you know, one of these little indies. Um, now, to do an anthology, to do this sort of project, a lot of indies will turn to crowdfunding to finance it. You know, they'll do Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and the like. But Nick Cato at Novella did something very different. On his blog at novellopublishershome.blogspot.com. Boy, that's a mouthful. (laughs) (laughs) He writes, This was our second anthology, and we wanted to compensate the author's interior formatter and cover artist without turning to a Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign. While those avenues are fine and work for many, we here at Novello Publishers, and by we, I mean me, just had too much going on to be worried about sending out perks and all the required promoting and ass-kissing that goes along with getting people to contribute to the cause through an online fundraising site. And let me tell you a quick aside. Coming off the naughty list, I know exactly what the fuck he's talking about. It's exhausting. Yes. Um So anyway, Nick thought long and hard on how to legally finance a project such as this. And it didn't take long for something to hit him. Nick writes, I work in Brooklyn, in a nice area, but right by an industrial section. Over the years, I would see people walking around with shopping carts full of scrap metal and all kinds of garbage. My boss told me these people are what's known as Mongo Recyclers. While a lot of homeless people engage in this form of money-making, there are also those who own their own businesses, and all they do is collect used metal from plumbing and house demolition jobs and bring their fines to metal recycling plants, where you change them in for money. You get a decent penny. Um, I myself used to do this back in the the early 90s before I was ever writing full-time. or I I did this to supplement my income. Um, Needless to say... Uh, Nick continues to write, one of the reasons this project took three years to come to fruition was he was collecting Mongo legally in his spare time to finance it. Uh, This is incredible, okay? He says, uh, I found a lot of metal 
at and around my area of employment, and when my trunk became full enough, I would stop at a metal recycling plant and cash in. Sometimes it was so-so, sometimes it was good, and there were months where I found nothing. But thankfully, by the end of 2015, I had brought in my last scraps of brass and aluminum and paid off our final contributor. So, he funded the entire anthology. The printing costs, the design costs, the art, paid all the authors for their stories by collecting scrap metal and selling it. I I think that's fucking awesome. That is. Uh, he is definitely more metal than yes. you or I. Well... Maybe not me, but uh, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've had that conversation before. No, this is really cool. Uh, yeah, it's very creative thinking, and uh, I had not heard the story before, so it's pretty entertaining. Uh, just imagine the guy. Um, this wouldn't work in every area, you know. No. <laughs> you know, like in New York City, it makes sense. Uh, around here, um, you, you'd be fighting the Shagas for scrap metal. Well, yeah, when I when I did it, you know, like I said, that was the early '90s. Yeah. I was living in Hanover, Pennsylvania, which yeah. is a big industrial uh, there's town. Tons anyway, of industrial so. stuff there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. I I may have not, yeah. you know, Nick stressed he did hit he did his legally. Yeah, I may not have done mine legally, which goes back to John Cothier's question about yes. authors and their moral we character. Won't, we won't talk about that because uh, you know, statute I, of limitations has to be passed on that. I, you know what? I don't feel like testifying for any grand juries, so we're just gonna. <laughs> We're gonna pass that subject over right now. No, Nick, you're a genius. Uh, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I, yeah. I love that. Applause. And, yes, applause. And you know what else we applaud? I applaud the fact that he wanted to pay his contributors. Well, that's a great thing. Too. So many people out there want to put together anthologies, and then it's you know, well, there's there's no money involved, and yeah, you need punch in the face. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> money should always be involved. I, I still want to do a show about working for free and why you should never do it. I want to have like you, me, and I don't know who the we guest should. would be. We but, should, um, but but that it's really a conversation that we need to have. I just I, I think it was Stephen Kozanowski one day was asking questions about that, and I'm like, we need to talk about this on the show. We should get him back on the show and holler at him about it. Uh, he could be here and he could just sit in that chair. Yeah, we could yell at him for an hour and a half. I'm sure he would enjoy that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, I'm promote his books at the end. After 90 minutes of berating the guy like he's a, you know on trial, and he'd be like, "So, Stephen, you have anything to plug?" <laughs> you know, I would listen to that. I would listen to that too. Yeah. I don't know if he would listen to that. Uh, well, you know. So uh, well, anyway, yeah, Nick yeah. Cato, Novello Publishing, and I, I do want to mention uh, the Gruesome Tensum is available for pre pre order on Amazon.com right now. Um, just type in the gruesome tensum, or I, maybe type in Herschel Gordon Lewis. You'll find it. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, it, you know what? That kind of thinking and that kind of dedication should yeah. be rewarded. Absolutely. So yeah, pre-order a copy, and they didn't Definitely. even pay for this spot or anything. No, it's <laughs> you know, um, I you know, I, anybody else out there that's it's you know in, in our field and it has some creative way like this that they you know put some money together. I mean, I have nothing against Kickstarter or anything like that. I, I happen to think it's a viable path to use. Again, we talked about I, I really want to do a show about you know crowdfunding. Right. And have somebody on who had a successful one and somebody on who was a disaster. Right. And, and talk about that because I, I have some opinions about it. Um, but, um, you know, if you have a creative way, like, you know, you collected scrap metal or we're donated plasma or whatever it was, uh, get in touch with us. I'd be curious to hear if there's any more stories like this because uh, this, <laughs> that's a really great story. It is. Yeah, yeah it's it much is. less depressing than some of the other stuff we were talking about. So, yeah. Well, you know what else will cheer you up? Uh, well, Max has been cheering me up today. He's been my buddy. Okay, so. you want a third thing that will cheer you up? Sure. Our interview with Adam Caesar. Oh, yes. Because really you were in a good mood during that. Uh, okay, I don't remember. I remember. Okay. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll get to that. Uh, before we do that, though, I do want to mention again, Project iRadio has a patron page. Um, if you just donate a dollar a month, just one dollar a month, and really, what can it's you like buy nothing. for a dollar a month? It's, it's like, yeah. it's nothing. Yeah. It's a dollar a month, yeah. and you will help the network in covering hosting costs and all the other expenses we're incurring. Um, by becoming a supporter, you'll get access to exclusive audio and video and much more. Uh, you can get all the information at patron.com slash project I radio. That's P A T R E O N.com slash project I radio. All right, let's go to our pre recorded interview with Adam and then we'll come back. Okay, Dave, joining us now in the studio is an author who is considered by many to be one of the best writers of a new generation of horror authors. His books include Tribesmen, Zero Lives Remaining, The Summer Job, Video Night, and many more. 
His nonfiction has appeared in Fangoria, the LA Review of Books, and he also writes a monthly column for Cemetery Dance Online. I am, of course, talking about Adam Caesar. Hi, yeah. yeah, guys. Hi. Right. Nice to be here. And you know what? That's my first fucking question, because right. everyone <laughs> pronounces it differently. Is it Adam Caesar, Adam Cesare? Well, it's a pen name, but it's also my middle name. Um, so when I was uh, first publishing, I was publishing under my own name. I started teaching uh, high school English, and I realized that um, some of the stuff I was publishing was going to be difficult to talk about uh, yeah. at a uh, parent-teacher <laughs> conference. Um, so I... I was like, oh, I'll just move my middle name over. And then I realized that um, my mother calls me C's. She calls me Adam Caesar all the time if I'm in trouble. Right. Um, so <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll just be Adam Caesar. And then I realized, wait, it's Cesare is how you technically say it. Uh, so I just introduced myself as uh, as Caesar. So if I ever see you messing up out there, like if I see you, I don't know, join HWA or something like <laughs> yeah. that, I can call you C's and you'll you'll know you're in trouble. Oh, yeah. No, I'll know, I'll know right away. <laughs> Mom calling It'll be a shrinking moment. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Dave. We we should point out Adam rolled in here with a posse that I have not seen the likes of since the days when I used to roll around with a posse. <laughs> exactly. Back in the day, uh, yeah. you know, Mike Lombardo. Which yeah. I, any posse that includes Lombardo is immediately suspect. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> Bizarro <laughs> writer Scott Cole and uh, super fans uh, Kevin and Kristen Foster and. Phoebe's in the house. Yes, that's Mary Santamari's in the house. <laughs> Stephen Kozanuski even showed up. He heard Adam and Scott were going to be here. Oh, can I come, please? Yeah. <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah, well, pretty uh, popular fella, huh? Yeah, yeah, popular and also needed a ride. So uh, <laughs> the, the, the Fosters were kind enough to, to drive uh, me and Scott over here. So. Yeah, I should put out Lombardo is doing his own show in the living room right now. <laughs> <laughs> Is the mic picking up? Can we get that? Uh, oh, dear oh, Lord. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> Don't mention him. It's like Candyman if you say his name to him. Yeah, it's exactly. He's going to pop up. Yeah. All right. Let's get to you, the health Lombardo. We've had him on the show. <laughs> um, now, we've had writers from your generation on the show before. Robert Swartwood, Stephen Kosganowski, the aforementioned Lombardo. Um, what I find interesting about them is their first introductions to the genre aren't necessarily Stephen King, Richard Matheson, Lovecraft, or Poe. For them, it's it's more movies or goosebumps or, you know, writers from my generation like myself, Mayberry, Gonzalez. Um, I know you studied film yes. in Boston. Yes. So what about you? Was, was it film that first got you into the genre or books? I was always a movie kid. I was raised in a, in a household where we watched movies. My dad brought me out to the movies a lot. Um, so... Movies, yes, definitely, like, even before reading, I've right. always liked movies, and I was always kind of scared of passing blockbusters, uh, you know, passing uh, Freddy Krueger's face. Uh, so I, I love film, but I, I, I was a, a reader, too, at an early age, and I think Stephen King was a big first influence for me. Okay. Um, and, and, and kind of... Was it, was it Stephen King's movies? Or did you I find think the books? Even before, even before, like, I think it was, like second or third grade I had to do a book report and it was like you had to choose a biography and they had a little like um uh young readers edition of a Stephen King biography yeah I chose to do it on that and I think it was before I had read I had had my father read me some of his short stories and it was before I had ever read any of his novels I read this kind of young readers biography of Stephen King so I kind of knew about the books and the movies before I had seen most of them and like I think the final project was like a oh, clothes hanger mobile uh, about Stephen King. So wow. I was just, I was brought up like already knowing something about what I knew I liked Stephen King even before I had been uh, exposed to a good number of his works. Right. And then leisure books from there, it was kind of the perfect timing to have that end cap on at Barnes and Noble of those two releases every month. Yeah. So yourself, um, you know, Ketchum, right. uh, Layman, uh, Lee, Things like that. Like, so I got them all kind of at the same time. And it was, I was reading everything because I was reading – and there was a lot of scholarship at the same time and a lot of like uh, – in the back of uh, On Writing, I think, in Stephen King, he lists a lot of books um, that he had read while he was composing that. Or, right. Or, and then Dance Macabre. So it, I was having a lot of things like recommended to me like Matheson through that. And that's how I kind of built my knowledge or, or, or knew – what I like to read. Okay. Now you said your dad would yeah. read you King Shorts. So your dad was a fan of the genre. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, uh, he's he's way more on the on the literary side of things. Way more on the uh, Stephen King 
uh, kind of Michael Crichton side of things. He's not he's he's not into horror movies like I am. He's no. not into no. He just he he he's just into everything and he values everything. So I think that's. Does he read your stuff? Uh, yes, he does. Yeah. Uh, a little bit delayed because he always he doesn't want me like sending him like PDFs or anything. So right. he'll he'll just wait until stuff's actually actually out and read it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He that's, he he likes it. Yeah. That's very cool, man. Yeah. No. My my dad has read one thing by me. He read Ghoul. Um, and the, you know, the scene in Ghoul where the father rips up the comic book collection. My dad did that to me in real uh, life. Uh, that's the only book he read by me. And, and he called me at like one o'clock in the morning in tears, apologizing for ripping up my comic book collection. So, but he hasn't picked up anything else by me since. <laughs> well, that's a great one. But... <laughs> so, uh, you know, one thing I like about you, you don't stick to one subsection of the genre. I mean, there's, there's hints of splatterpunk. There's a sense of extreme horror, like lame and catch them. Uh, there's a lot of humor in your stuff, which I don't think you get a lot of credit for. Um, I venture that it even at times slides into bizarro. Um, you know, author-wise, now I know you mentioned the Leisure Books line, but but who else would you count as an influence? Because I, I see, I could cherry-pick a whole bunch of diverse stuff from your work. You know? I think a, a lot of... Um a lot of the conscious um, influence is uh, is is Joe Lansdale. Okay. Just because I like the idea that he writes in a lot of different genres, and I, I kind of want to try to do that myself. That's and what it, I suspected. And there is a lot of humor, and I think something like uh, I kind of roll out this chestnut a lot, so people only probably only think I've read one book, but um, <laughs> uh, the drive-in is kind of like this great weird philosophical text almost oh, and it's absolutely. very hysterical and and th that I, I i read that i was kind of late to that that wasn't during the period of like reading leisure paperbacks and stuff we were right. talking about before but when i read that i was thinking about starting writing at the same time and i was like this is that's the book that kind of pushed me over the edge yeah just because yeah it, that book pushed a lot of us over the edge um you know uh i mean writers as diverse as from carlton mellick to joe hill to myself you know we all cite the drive-in yeah. um and it's interesting that you're citing as well i mean you know, you're. We see you as the next one of the next generation, but you're still citing the drive-in as an influence. I, I have to suspect that 50 years from now, it's still going to be influencing no, authors and writers. Fantastic. You know, um, if I may be wrong on this, but I believe the first novel you wrote for publication was Video Night. Yes, that's correct. Okay, but your first two published novels were Bound by Jade and Tribesman. They both came out in 2012, right? Yes. Um, uh, Tribesman was with um, was with John Skip's right. faded Ravenous Shadows line, and then he he helped me bring the book back out with Dead Eye. Right uh, now, was, recently was that just a cold submission to Skip? Um, it was this this is the the real information age because it was on Facebook. Uh, I was his Facebook friend, and he had said something about he was starting a line of, right. of novellas, and I I finished Video Night at the, at the time. Was waiting on Don Duria to um, read it, and I was like, oh, I can. And Don takes, Don really takes a while sometimes. Yeah, it's a, it takes a little, it's a little while. He's a great guy, though. But mm -hmm. yeah, he takes a little while. Well, Don's great people, but yeah, he's yeah. he's always he's busy. He's I mean, always he's got yeah. fifty manuscripts. Yeah, exactly. You know? um, so I I had just pitched it in a Facebook message to uh, John, and that was like my first real interaction with him. Like I I had reviewed books and stuff like that by right. him and read his books, and uh, but I'd never interacted, and he was just so warm and quick to get back to me and enthusiastic. Were you is, nervous? I mean, this is John Skip. Oh, very, you know? no, yeah, very. And then he was like, oh, send me an email here. And, and, and I I just, I wrote the thing based on a little uh, paragraph and a half. I, I sent him like a, a pitch. Yeah. And he was into it. Um, now, did you, when, I know you, you know, you mentioned the Leisure Books line was a big influence on you. Don, when you were at Sam Hain, Don was at Sam Hain. He yes. was their editor. Was it the, the same sort of experience? Were you nervous contacting him and submitting or had you worked through it by then i i was uh i actually pitched that book in a pitch session at a, at a world horror okay. um then it was on long island so it was i grew up on long island so it was like you know 20 minutes away from kind of my parents house and uh so i was at a sheraton and very very nervous like right. i could barely talk to him and he was just he it, it ended with him being like you seem really nervous and he's like oh you're in, i see you're in boston and we just talked about like Warren Zevon and, and different clubs in Boston that were and weren't there. And yeah. He, like, really put me at ease, so... Yep, yeah. he, he was great at that. So, okay, so 2012, your first two novels get published. Um, 
And one of them, you know, the legendary John Skip is instrumental in helping you yes. see the light of day. Uh, four years later, because now it's 2016. Four years. Four years, and you have blown the fuck up. Uh, no, no, <laughs> dude. You got praise from me. Praise yeah. from John Skip. Praise from Dwayne Swarzynski. Oh, yeah. You've worked with Don Daria. You've written, what, ten books? Oh, I don't know. I, probably close to if that. You yeah, the if you count the no, any yeah. novellas. And, yeah. yeah. Some of them are very short books. Yeah. I get um, <laughs> no, my kids are loaded with them. You know, you've got a column for Cemetery Dance. You've got your own Wikipedia entry, Adam. Yeah, in I don't know. In four years' that. time. In four years' time. Does that fuck with you? Uh, not really. No. no? I'm, I'm, I'm very... Um, <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not even gonna say modest, but I'm very um, restless. So yeah. I'm like, oh no, I'm always just thinking of what the next thing is, and always worrying about it too. So yeah. I'm very anxious. So yeah. <laughs> I just want to get. <laughs> I just want to get stuff done and, and out there. I don't. No. Do you still feel like a newbie, like a beginner, or are you starting to feel like, okay, yeah, I've I've got a place here. I'm doing this. And... I think little by little, yeah. every day, like uh, I'll get, um, I'll realize that I'm not as afraid to submit to people or not as um don't feel like as much of a newbie it's the publishing side of things i don't feel like a newbie about like the writing side of things every time i sit down to start something new i'm uh not sure where it's gonna go right. or like i'm like ah oh, I, I, even you know if you if you've done it like 10 times or whatever i'm still like well this is a new book and it needs to do new things and it needs to be its own thing so it, i never stop feeling that terror yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the business itself you're at ease with i feel a little better yeah. i feel like i can look over contracts and stuff like it's, that a it's little broken better. your and heart it, now and oh exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. no yeah you, you you do enough wrong things and then you i don't know hopefully you learn you learn from your mistakes and hopefully i have but absolutely yeah all right yeah. all right um i mean you mentioned you're always thinking about the next one do you think being prolific is one of the keys to how successful you have been in four years um, I think a lot of people that I think the publishing industry has clearly changed. I mean, right. not to not to lead this into one of those kinds of conversations, well, we like oh, the changing you know, you know way of publishing. It's just I I don't think anyone knows the answer as like oh how do we how do we like kind of keep the success because that idea of like frontless self backlist maybe doesn't work so much right. anymore if it doesn't if you can't have something that kind of hits the zeitgeist that moves things because it's like you can have now with like with self-publishing and things like that you can have 10 books but they're all 10 books that are sectioned off on one section of amazon and if they're not like kind of linked up to anything or you don't have people talking about them then you can write a million books and you can you know zero from zero is zero like um but and that's the that's that's that anxiety talking again (laughs) of like I, i i i yeah, but I got news for you. That anxiety never goes away. Oh, I'm sure. No, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Later, I still I'm, get I'm, it, and I'm, 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 I'm strapped in for a lifetime of this, so I'm ready. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, seriously, man. I, it seems like every week uh, Amazon's telling me you got something new out. You know, I get the little, the little email thing, or every time I get a a package from Thunderstorm Books, it seems like there's something in there by you. Oh, yeah, that's, um, I mean, that's a recent development, and they're, they've been really cool. Paul's been really cool. Yeah? Yeah. Are, yeah. are you finding, because I used to have a day job, right? Um, it, right now, yes and no. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, do, are you finding, do you have to race to keep up? Do you feel, like, pressure to stay prolific? Or I feel pressure you, to stay prolific and, and pressure to, to kind of, track down, you know, odd jobs and work for higher stuff and, and, and things like that. I, yes, I very much feel yeah. that kind of, yeah, pull. Have you done the rating, the, the trunk novels yet and polishing them up to submit them? Oh, that's the problem. Cause I get, like, I'll get, um, people emailing me about like, if, if I have a story for a market or if I have a, um, if I have a novel, like they'd love to see, like they'd love to see it. And I, I don't have I don't have a trunk I don't have anything to cannibalize I just have I'm like, I tell people it's like this is big to order it's like yep. if you want <laughs> if you want something I gotta I gotta build it yeah. it's hard to say no to that because yeah. you never know you, you never know when the next invite's gonna come you know you want to say yes to everything if they're paying obviously oh yeah, but, yeah. Um, now you've also you know in addition to all your solo stuff you've collaborated with David Bernstein Shane McKenzie Christopher Rufty Matt Serafini Cameron Pierce 
Um, yeah. Were you friends with all these guys before that happened? I mean, uh, have you guys uh, sort of come up together? Or? I think, yeah, I think we have, and I think you know separately because I, I only see them like you know once a year if at I'm cons. lucky. Yeah, at cons. Um, but it's it, it really does feel that way. It's strange how we are, uh, especially Shane and Cameron, who who both I've, I've I've collaborated with on a book and then it, and then like on separate projects. Right. So they're like kind of like my constant collaborators. It, it just feels weird that I like. You know, I've, I've no Cameron, but I've met him like three times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I talk to him a lot, or I talk to Shane a lot, but I've met him and his wife like at con like twice. Yeah, yep. yeah. You know, I used uh, to. You know, people used to have. Well, why do you go to all these conventions? I, that's when I see my friends. You yeah, know, because yeah, yeah. it was the same for us. Levin and Chris Golden, Jim Moore, myself, Urban Sick, Gonzalez. I mean, you know, I could go on and on, but the only time we would see each other is at con. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, and it's um, it's it's a it's a strange phenomenon because I, I I just recently moved not not too recently but within the last few years moved to Philadelphia. Right. And I don't know that many people. Like a lot of my good friends are are either um, like girlfriends, coworkers, things like that. Right. Um, and and Scott Cole, who is who I had known before moving down, and you know we've become really good friends. We hang out a lot. But it, it's like, well, a lot of my actual friends are like people I see on Facebook, but yeah. I don't I don't in any way feel like strange about that because I, I do talk to them a good amount and you know we work together and I email them so, right so. okay um is the I mean you know you you did all this solo work and you've had a lot of success in a very short time as we've talked about uh when it comes to collaborations was there a learning curve there or I mean do you find that easy or it, it's different with every collaborator because it's really it really depends on on how they on how you want to do it. Um, I'm, I'm actually working on something now with Adam Howe. He's oh, yeah. A, uh, yeah, he's a British yeah. guy. Um, and, and the way that we're working is way different than the way that Cameron and I work or, or Shane and I work or Matt and I. Um, because Matt and I, the thing that we released together was just short stories. So it was like, okay, you go off, write your three short stories, I'll write mine. Um, the, it's, it's just different depending on the person. And it's, and it's sometimes it's way more hands-on. Like with Adam... Um, we're, we're writing this, um, uh, crime, sci-fi, public enemies meets John Carpenter's The Thing, uh, <laughs> 1930s noir, and he's this, I mean, he's a, he's, lives south of London, but he's, like, this repository of, like, knowledge about Americana and stuff like that, and I'm like, I'm the American, and I'm the, I'm the one that's not gonna be able to bring the references and, and things, so he's, uh, yeah, so he, he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting there just on research and things, um, so... Yeah, it's just it's, it's a very different process, and like we're talking a lot before we're actually putting pen to paper. But with Cameron and I, it's basically uh, sometimes I feel like he's trying to um, he's just deliberately trying to make the story uh, one up uh, you. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I, I just I, I joked we're we're writing one now, another one for Severed, um, and I and I just said no aliens, like don't do not <laughs> do not put space aliens in this killer eel story. Do not I swear, Cameron. <laughs> Rules for Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've collaborated with Shane. Um, He's fun, but oh my god, he like he loves to one up it. Oh, and, well, especially know. the the thing that you guys oh, were writing, yeah. and he had invited me to that. Uh, uh, Jackpot was a book I written with uh, Christopher Rufty and and David Bernstein yep. and, uh, and 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 Shane, and it was Shane's idea. And I and he, it's an extreme horror. It's about a serial killer who wins the lottery. And anyone who knows Shane's work is going to be like, oh, that's going to be clearly a very extreme book. And right. I and like you you said before, I I I get I guess I have like extreme horror cred quote air quotes um but i don't i don't consider myself an extreme horror I don't, guy. Uh, i don't consider you one either but yes i do think you know rightly or wrongly you've been tired with that brush so to speak um but yeah clearly, i don't mind it yeah, i just, I I just mean, don't think my i like i think if you look at uh, rat james white or something and then you look at yeah. my stuff it's, it's you know it's sesame street comparatively I, uh <laughs> i think you're like me i think there are moments where you you do write very good extreme horror, but like I said, like myself or Jonathan Jans, you can you can turn around and do the quiet stuff, you can do humor, um, but extreme horror is what sells these days. Is what people want. Hey, and yeah. Ride the fucking wave, man. That's my <laughs> advice. I one collaboration you did, and, and Dave, I don't know if you've read this yet or not. Leprechaun in the Hood, <laughs> the musical, a novel. Now you did that with with Cameron and Shane McKenzie. How the fuck did that come about? <laughs> that was um, I, I I wasn't there for the mythical birth of this thing. Um, supposedly, I think it was a 
um, part of the Bizarro Con, the sketches, or, right. or Pitch Fest uh, is what they used to call it, when they just throw out a lot of pitches, and, like, then depending on, like, the temperature of the room, you, like, see if you want to write what you uh, what you pitched. So Cameron pitched this... Um, I don't know how much it changed in what we actually wrote, but it's the idea that um, every... Anyone who likes musicals realizes that Broadway has this this tendency now. Any kind of movie property, they're going to adapt into a musical. Right. It's easier to sell tickets to. So it's like, well, what would what would horror fans, especially horror fans in Portland, this very like kind of um, ridiculous culture, uh, uh, um, what would they what would they choose to adapt into a musical if they were going to do it? <laughs> well, clearly they do. Um, Leprechaun in in the hood, and they turn it into a musical. But we're going to write the novel about the people that write Leprechaun in the Hood, the musical. And of course, like those people, they don't have the rights, so it's a it has to be protected under parody law. Right. And the it becomes kind of meta because the Leprechaun in the novel isn't the Leprechaun from the series of films because that would be <laughs> copyright infringement. He is the basis for that. And since they don't have the copyright, he's kind of punishing them for their 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 the way that they're looking at intellectual intellectual property uh, right. so it's this it's it's a very strange book and there's it, it's a collaboration in the truest sense because there's cameron's very weird um you know pitch very bizarro and then there's shane's ultra violence right and then there's you I in the middle. I don't know what I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to tether both of them together. Uh, it worked. Uh, right. It worked. I loved it. Thank you. So, okay, Leprechaun, you know, while we're on the film bet, and, and you know, Dave, I know you've worked in Hollywood. I, I've told my stories about Hollywood. Adam, you've got a background in film. You know, you studied film in college. Um, film features into several of your books, Mercy House, Video Night. Um do you have any desire to do screenplays, or is that just not in your wheelhouse? Um, it is in my wheelhouse, and it's the only thing that I've. Um, it's the only thing I've been formally trained in. Like I've, I, I, I take, I took like one kind of starter creative writing class, and it was like the thing that I found myself doing most there is poetry. So it's I, I, I have, but I took all the screenwriting classes I could in college. So I like I, I know the format, and I like the format, and I, and I've written. Um, I've written a few, and I'm actually working on one now. That's it's the first time I'm like I have like a contract to like do something like that. So it's it's still kind of new for me. And I've written spec scripts, and I've written scripts based on some of my books because I've been asked to. Um, nothing's happened yet, but I feel like that's kind of par for the course for right. any kind of movie uh, thing. But uh, that's partly why I write prose because I want people to read what I write, and I want them to kind of have my version of these stories right um, but i i love film and it's, you know it's like my you know it's like my second life is film so i i want to make movies and i want you know people who like my stuff to have movies but right. i'm not it's not something i it's not something i kind of like it's not the hell i'm gonna die on you yeah know what i mean like I, I i i'm gonna keep writing scripts and stuff like that and maybe if something happens i'll be happy but I, i'll always have prose and it's not like prose is any kind of like unloved child that right. I, 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 I'm a big enough reader and I and I'm, I know that prose is prose and, and films are films do you know what I mean mm. I, 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 I think a lot of I think a lot of either writers starting out or writers who have and, I, and, and this isn't directed at anyone in particular but there are books that read like screenplays or there are books that read like uh, pitches. Oh, uh, absolutely. And, I don't, sure. and, and I'm not, uh, as a reader, I'm not in love with those, so I don't want to ever write something that feels like yeah. that. Um, uh, early in my career, um, the number one criticism leveled at me, other than I couldn't write, <laughs> was uh, that that my books read like like screenplays or comic books. And I think that I I don't know about screenplays, but I, I think there is something to the fact that my early novels read like comic books because I was thinking like a comic book. You know, with each chapter being a single issue and ending on a cliffhanger, and you you know you got to go to the next chapter. But that's cinematic. That's cinematic. Re- I don't know. I would disagree with your critics who would say that because could you I, go I, on I, Amazon I, and, and disagree with them? I, 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 no, I will. No, I love getting in uh, flame wars. Uh, but I I, 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 that's maybe I didn't put it the most delicate way. But I, I really do 
I really do think there's a difference between cinematic writing uh, and 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 things that are transparently meant for adaptation. Like, oh, I'm just getting like, hopefully one day, like you know, right. you could tell when that's not the first um, the first stop for a story idea. Like, if it's meant to be just an intellectual right, property like, mine, you know what like, I mean? It's like, I really want this to be a movie, but I can't sell it, so I'm going to turn a book and exactly. like, I can sell yeah, it. Mark, yeah, Mark yeah. Millar has made an entire career in comic books <laughs> off that, right? I, I Honestly, I, I you know, it, yeah. it is fascinating that, that, yeah, he comes up with these things, and he wants to make a movie, nobody will make it, so he turns into a comic book, and then they trip over themselves to make it into yeah, a movie. Yeah, you know? It's yeah. just like, you know, you could have skipped the, the whole thing Have you guys thing discussed there. Kingsman on this, on this podcast? Uh, right? I don't mean to yeah, get us I, off on a tangent. Have I you, haven't like, seen it yet. I read... I, read, uh, I talked about it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Did yeah. you did you like it? Or? I loved it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely loved it. So Mark Millar can do as many That's, backdoor pilots for movies I, as he wants, because I really love that movie. My two favorite movies last year were that and... The Mad Max movie. So. I just I want him to finish. I can't remember the name of the the comic. He uh, only the first issue came out. It was uh, these American soldiers who all got superpowers, and, so. and they decided to become super villains. Huh. And uh, he, one issue came out. I it wasn't through Image. I can't remember who published it, but uh, I guess he couldn't sell the movie rights, so he never finished so the series. <laughs> so well, and now I, you you had mentioned earlier this thing. You're working on uh, sort of, you know, it's got a crime plot. My my other question was, uh, you know, what about a crime novel? Because I think your style would lend itself well to a, just a straight. I a thousand percent agree with this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to see you write straight a crime novel. I, I yeah, I, I tried to with um, a book called uh, the first one you expect because it was it was written expressly for um, Broken River books. Yeah. They're and they're a crime outfit, but um, the 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 editor there, J. David Osborne, is so nebulous in his definition of crime mm -hmm. that I think I was able to write kind of a um, a hard novel with a crime flavor. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, so I'd, I'd love to do a more straight noir. Um, I love that genre. Um, right, that's your mission when you leave here today. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I don't need any, uh, anything else. <laughs> Thank you, but... <laughs> well, you know, speaking of the future, now I, I know you're no longer with Sam Hain, um, mm -hmm. and we're not going to we're not going to cover that in the show. We've talked about Sam Hain at length, folks. Yes. You can go back and listen to old episodes. We're, we're moving forward now. Um, who are you with these days? I know you got Thunderstorm. Uh, uh, Thunderstorm's doing limiteds. Deadite. Uh, Deadite has just, Tribesmen, I believe. They have Tribesmen. I, well, I, well, even before, even even before I, 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 you know, parted ways with Sam Hain, um, and which is not like any kind of big scandal thing. I no. was just like. It was, it, just didn't kind of sign up for more. Right. Um, I was diversifying. I was I was having books with different publishers. Which just is smart, and I like you because you listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was, it, Unlike like pretty much everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was partially by accident, just because people, like I said, people were asking me for things, and I'm like, who might I say no if people are, want books? Right. I'll write them for them. Um, and uh, so I like I was kind of diversified before that, and I. I I have, uh, Matt Serafini and I have our, our book, All Night Terror, uh, which was only self-published before. We're, we're expanding that, um, and Sinister Grand's going to put it out. Oh, so really? Hopefully, yeah. Okay. They're, they're going to put that out, and they do they do limited to all their stuff, so I imagine they'll do a limited to that. Um, and my next novel, and I don't know when this is coming out, because I'm, I'm, I'm actually waiting on cover art for it, um, I'm going to try to self-publish, which I haven't done I've done little experiments with it. I've done uh, a collection, and then that that collection with uh, Matt. Right. But um, it it terrifies me because I don't like being in charge of everything. I like having someone I can whine to, right. complain to, because I like whining and complaining. But um, I'm just gonna try it, just because. You gonna go full force, paperback and digital? Yeah, it's gonna or? be. There's yeah. gonna be a paperback, and uh, yeah, it's 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 something that I feel like people people like. If if anyone's read me, they've read. Tribesman, because it's like that's the one that sells the most. It has that's, a great cover. That's the one I hand people when they say they haven't read you yet. I hand them Tribesman. That was the first one I read. Yeah, and, and I gotta say now. the the Thank cover you. is what sold it to me because I had not heard your name before. Yeah. But I saw that cover, I'm like, I need to read this on on the Dead Eye Press edition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We that, talked about yeah. that on the show. We talked about Matthew that cover Rivera. before. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's great. I, it's yeah. seriously, I would put in like the top ten book covers I've seen in the last five or six years. Yeah, I, I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I. And the book's really good too. Yeah. It's not just the cover. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, no, that book kicks ass. Yeah. But I, I, so I, I, I wrote this book and I, and it's kind of 
of a of a piece with tribesmen. It's like people ask if I'll write sequels and stuff like that, and I don't. I don't know if there's like enough demand for me right. to write a sequel to anything. Like, but I'll I'll go back into modes. Like you were saying, I like I like I like writing different my different takes on different subgenres um, because I love the width and breadth of horror, and I feel like there's a lot there and there's a lot of division right. so I don't I try not to write the same thing over and over again but this book is, is called The Con Season and it's about um, it's about uh, these kind of sea uh, level movie stars that are that are doing the con circuit they, they you know they signed autographs to themselves and, right um, and they, they get they all get this invitation to come to a uh, a new kind of con it's a summer camp uh, and when they get there they realize that it's um, basically like a um a kind of art installation where they're going to be, people are invited to come buy tickets to watch them be killed in a kind of summer final <laughs> uh, Sign me up right now, man. <laughs> I mean, yeah. First of all, I want to read that right now. <laughs> Second of all, you talk about movies. That would be a kick-ass movie right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, seriously, you get a bunch of C-list actors yeah. in that? Yeah. Well, not even C-list, just yeah. uh, icons. You get, like, Ken Faree and Reggie Bannister yeah. and, you know, Tony Todd. How much fun Kane. would that be? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's a genius idea. Thank you. Don't yeah. anybody steal it. I kind of want to option the movie rights. Right. Yeah. Lombardo, get in here. <laughs> <laughs> He's been I, I found our next movie. I found our follow-up to White Doomsday. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Um, give him the pitch right now. Yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> oh boy, um, the con season. Did I tell you about this one or no? I don't think so. Uh, it's a, a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of celebrities that sign uh, that sign at conventions get a invitation to a new convention, but it's actually kind of a um, uh, a, a a a pop art installation where they're going to be killed in front of an audience uh, at a summer camp. I love that. So it's a, <laughs> All right, so so I can option this. We can do that. But again, like Cabin in the Woods, like The Final Girls, these are not movies that blew up the box office. This is, this is the mold that it would be in. So yeah, well, uh, we, 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 we could do that. First like, one you'd expect. I was thinking about the movie version of that. The whole the best part would be the convention scenes because you could just talk about all these burnt out celebrities and dealing with horror fans. We, <laughs> it, we could do that for like twenty thousand, right? Twenty five. Well, I mean, after my salary, sure. Yeah, after you're still, okay, so... <laughs> no, no, after you pay me to write music. <laughs> <laughs> well, shit, look at the budget right there. All right, all right Lombardo, go, go back to your show. <laughs> back to your How's there. things going there in the living room? Uh, I can't talk about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you have a mop, by the way? Do I have a mop? <laughs> Never mind, I'll take care of it. Go away. Yeah. Oh, dear. He loves it so much. He loves it. It's like a Carol Burnett show. Like yeah. he lo- <laughs> How did you guys meet? Did you- um, we kind of known of each other for a little while, but the the book that, that just came out, um, Zero Lives Remaining, is a, a the the publisher is Shock Totem, and they oh, yeah. they wanted to do a um a commercial for it. They wanted to do a, a thing, and they, That's they right. hired, they oh, hired yeah. Mike, and I knew he was out in Lancaster, so I. Yeah, I, I, I took the train out and watched them do that. Are there copies of that limited edition remaining? As of speaking right now, there are a handful. Okay, there's, a, there's a couple left. I want to tell folks, now, you know, in a minute here, we're going to give Adam a chance to plug. And, you know, his books are readily available on Amazon. Um, they're affordable for all of you. But if you are a collector and you like limited editions, and I'm a collector. I like Dave. You've seen my collection. Absolutely, I've got yes. I've got signed Arthur Machen. I, I've got a signed Lovecraft. I, yeah. I know, you know what you're doing. Yeah, you like me. <laughs> that shock totem edition of Zero Lives Remaining is the nicest, nicest limited edition I've ever seen. Wow. Well, I mean, it, you. It, I you know it. I there's pictures of it on their website. I'm sure, but it's designed to look like a VHS tape. And it's just, it's amazing the way they did that. I mean, it's a genius, I, yeah. 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 I had nothing to do with it, so I can, like, you know, I can talk it up. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of artists, and, and, and Ken Wood, who's very exacting. It took a little while when people pre-ordered it, but I think it's I think it's worth it. Oh, I absolutely. Mean, it's, it, it, it's a really, like, nice piece. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. It's yeah. one of those things that, even if you know people that don't read hard at all, you would show them this, and they'd be like, "This is really cool." It, like it yeah. has trading yeah. cards yeah. in it. It's, it's, amazing. it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. It's like, yeah. it's such. It's like a piece of art. It really is. All right. Well, Dave, do you have anything for Adam before um, we sign off? Here? No, no. You pretty much covered everything right. there. Uh, I, I'm not. I haven't read as many of his, his of his stuff as you have. So, okay. but like I said before, Tribesman was like, <laughs> I love so that much. book. Yeah. When you know, I, obviously, I've been doing a lot of plugging 
for your generation. Um, you and know, I'm blurbing everything that you're saying well, right now. Do it, man. <laughs> can, I didn't give you that warning you can before. Steal twenty different blurbs from the yeah, show. Yeah, no, I will. Um, no, you know, when when people ask me what what should I read by him, I usually suggest Tribesman or The Summer Job. I think those are both fine introductory works. They showcase everything you're capable of doing. Well, so, thank you uh, for suggesting this, yeah. and, and thanks for the Summer Job because that, that's my that's like when people ask like what they what what they should start with. That's my favorite one. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not supposed to have favorites, but I like, it's just the one that I think has the blandest look to it or like maybe the, it doesn't have like a hook. Like right. It's not like a, it's not a high concept thing. It's like a faux car. Yeah. You know, um, but I thought I like it, it I, I thought it showed off your versatility very well, Thank you. you know? Um, all right. Well, where can folks find you online? Um, Where's the best place to send them? It, it, it's just adamcaesar.com. Uh, C e s a r e. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So I guess in the in the show titles or show notes they'll they'll yep. find how to how to spell it. Yep. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll spell it out. And uh, yeah. Adam, thank you for coming in. Thanks for bringing the posse with you. Oh, they, you know, <laughs> they, I thank them. I mean, I, I, I not so much Lombardo. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah but Scott Cole yeah. and, and the posse. Everybody else is fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> so all right, Dave, let's head back to the studio. And we're back. See, I told you you were in a good mood. Okay. <laughs> I, I, we do these things, and it's like, you know, two weeks ago. I, I don't remember what I did yesterday. So, you know, that's why my brain doesn't work very well. As you, you may have why? noticed. You know why? It's because you're a fucking mummy. You're uh, a, yes. You I'm, and David yeah. Scout. See, I'm going to tease him about this every week now <laughs> until we get him on the show. Yeah. So. <laughs> you should not have said that. <laughs> All right. He's going to be like, why did I talk to Keith? <laughs> For the record, Scott, I, I, Mr. Scott, I don't think you're old. So, Mr. Uh, Scout? Yeah, well, yeah, seriously. Wow. Yeah. You know, okay. I, have we ever talked on the show? I know we talked about the the when he first invited me and Coop and Mike and Mikey to right. his house. Right, you told that but, story. But have I ever talked about the first time I went to his house? I don't think so because the story you told was the you you weren't yeah there. I it, yeah. we sent coop and fail right, right. which was a mistake yeah I said yes um yeah year I guess like maybe two three years later um I guess not having learned his lesson from having coop and fail Monte in his home uh, <laughs> we got another invite now Jesus and I were were out in L A doing some signings and uh, you know Jesus just says all nonchalantly oh. David Scow wants us to uh, to drop by. How do you feel about that? I, I think I said something like, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and Jesus thought this was hilarious because he knew that. And yeah, uh, he was a gracious host. He's a wonderful guy. His his house is fucking awesome. You know, it's up there in the Hollywood Hills. And uh, I I was dumbstruck all night. <laughs> I mean, literally, I, there are very few people that, I get that way with, but I was, I was, I sat there like a, a fucking lump all night and let him and Jesus talk, you know, talking Robert Block and this and that. And the whole night I'm just sitting there. That's David fucking Scout. <laughs> you know, now it's years later and now I can call him a fucking mummy and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he was, he very much put me at ease and he was a gracious host and he's a wonderful, sweet guy. But yeah, that, that first time at his house, I, oh my God, it was like I had a stick up my ass. I was afraid to move. I just, you know, um, and there, there's creature from the Black Lagoon memorabilia everywhere in every room, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm fanboying out on that. Yeah. I'm fanboying out on Scowl. I'm, I'm fanboying out on his collection of Robert Block. Um, and once again, just very jealous of, of how Jesus came of age growing up out there in that scene and being in that scene at such a young age, you know, but all right. Well, that was an aside. Uh, one more time. I want to mention project. I radio's patron page project. I radio network has experienced unprecedented growth over the last year. Uh, but with that growth comes great expenses for just $1 a month. You will help the network covering hosting costs, ensuring that the hosts of your favorite podcasts, never have to pay for hosting themselves and can focus instead on what matters most to you, making amazing content. By becoming a supporter, you'll get access to exclusive audio and video and much more. Check them out, patron.com slash project I radio, P A T R E O N.com slash project I radio. If there's something you want to talk to us about, hit us up on Twitter, 
Facebook, or our website, thehorrorshowwithbriankeen.com. How's the Facebook page going? It's going good. Are we um, still at 666 followers? No, we're, we're, we're up to in the 670s now, I think. I, I even looked this week because it was my birthday and I was offline. Yeah. Um, Measure Project I Radio, I believe there's a week left in their uh, People's Choice Awards. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We should mention the People's so, Choice uh, Awards. You know, you can go vote for your favorite show. I'm not going to tell you what show to vote for, but it would be this one. Um, you know, it um, would be this one if you were going to tell them. Yeah. 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 And I guess they can do that at Project iRadio.com. Project iRadio.com. There's a little banner right on the front page there. You can click on it and vote for your favorite show. Um, you know, and there's a lot of good shows on there. So, you know, check them out. I voted. I believe I did too. I voted for Respawn Radio, I believe. I think that's what I voted for so, too. I honestly don't remember. I remember yeah, voting. Because Nicholas Pichon does not have a podcast on the network yet. <laughs> You know, seriously, if he did, it would be the most popular show. Online. I would, I would produce it. I would volunteer to produce the <laughs> fuck out of that show. <laughs> oh dear! And, and we'd get Stefano to be his co-host. <laughs> no, I couldn't do that to Stefano. No, I couldn't do that to anybody. That's mean. <laughs> but, yeah. Oh man. Yeah. No, I voted for. Uh, I voted for respawn. I think that's what I voted for too. Yeah. I actually like that show. Well, so. Now watch, they'll win by two votes. Yeah, it'll be, it'll our, be our fault. fault. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> You know, I, I, you know, it, it, any of these, especially like this is like a, you know, it's a contest. You, if you win, it's cool. If you don't win, it's cool. Well, it's I, nice I, to be thought of. I haven't been bringing it up because, you know, we, it's a, it's a competition against our friends. Yeah. I, you know, it's Armand and Kelly and, you know, the chuckleheads on yeah. Three Guys at Beer. Yeah, I don't want to, like, I, it's I like I'm happy if any of these people will win. It's, yeah. you know, and, you know, I've seen our, our show listed on a, a couple of different places where it was like, you know, best of the year. And I really appreciate this, but I, I hate, like, promoting myself you know what i mean it's like i don't want people to think that we just here and like or me personally looking for like mentions of me online or something you know it, it's cool when people like the show that's that's really what makes me happy yeah i like the show exactly yeah so exactly. you listen every week and you you occasionally say hey that was funny or you know whatever that, that that's great like uh i enjoy the commentary on uh the brian's message board on the forum yeah 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 all right. Well, the horror show is available on iTunes, Android, Roku, Stitcher, and all other platforms via the aforementioned Project iRadio. You can visit them online at, once again, projectiradio.com. If you would like to advertise on Project iRadio's network, contact Jess, J-E-S-S, at projectiradio.com. Or more importantly, if you'd like to advertise right here on the horror show, contact Dave. You can email him at meteornotes at gmail.com. They're emailing you right now, Dave. I I, I hope so. Um, you know, I like to occasionally buy groceries. So. He also likes adult pictures. <laughs> no, emailed no, I him. do not. I absolutely. I, and it's his birthday. No, so it wasn't. It was no photos of anything. So there, stop that. All right, next week we don't have a guest scheduled. We have uh, no topics. Coming up, so you know maybe the HWA will do something stupid. Um, you never know. We'll find out next yes. week. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>